It doesn't matter how many arms or legs you've got for pole dancing, it's hard regardless of what package you come in. We're all gonna get bruises, we're all gonna be sore. I was born without most of my left arm. When I came into the studio for my first pole lessons, like wow, I never thought that I'd be able to do this. I've never felt so amazingly sexy, powerful, unique, and it reinforces that limiting factors of my body are not necessarily in my number of limbs, but they're in my own perception. It's incredibly empowering for me to know that I am strong enough and capable enough to do what I do. Hi. I'm Deb. That was me, in case you didn't recognise me with clothes on. <laughs> oh wait, you, you probably did. But in fairness, I don't actually feel like myself with this many clothes on, because being dressed like that's more part of my job. Do you love your job? I really love my job. I am empowering people through movement, or my expression of movement, every single day. It's really rewarding. And it wasn't until about 10 years ago that I actually came to embrace my physicality and start to take this body out for a run and see what it could do. I left behind a career in network engineering in information technology and started to explore and understand how the human body could work and how I could make it do some really fun stuff. On the way, I ended up picking up two international dance titles and um, I'm a pioneer in my field. I was the first person with a disability to this level to figure out how to adapt and translate really advanced pole tricks and transitions. So I wrote a book about it called Pole Translation to help other instructors out there make pole accessible and inclusive for anyone who might want to do it. Because that's the world I want to see. One that recognises that all of humanity is diverse and that we all have the equal right to enjoy our opportunities. And I get to do that every day, and it's a real good laugh. So I just want to give you an experience of what my job's like. If you're able to, get on up. You've been sitting there for ages. <laughs> so I'd like you to uh, take a big breath in and reach up as high as you can and uh, freeze. Oh, how good does that feel? Hands in the air like you just don't care. Amazing. All right, now I can see around the room that there aren't very many visual learners. You can all sit back down because every time I go to the studio and I've got a new class, you can bet that there's one student in my room that's like, one hand in the air. And I'm, I tell them in my preamble, right? Um, I've got one arm, so I'll be doing things like this, but I'll tell you what to do with both of yours. And still, they want to do exactly what the teacher does, so they do it exactly the same way as I do, and it gives me a right chuckle. I don't take it badly. Um, <laughs> so what more could I want, right? My life is really rewarding. I travel the world, I teach people movement, I live in my passion. It's great. Oh, God, I'm one of them. I'm one of those inspirational people with a disability who's going out there and kicking life butt and making you feel a little bit crap. Did you think that I was here to give you a motivational speech <laughs> about how I overcame adversity and lived triumphantly? Sorry, I'm not. See, what they've done with our friend here, I mean, he looks pretty happy, right? He's clearly been carving up that athletics track, rocking his blades, loving life. But what's that written in green on his chest? Oh, on his... Mm. Crotch. <laughs> that says, your excuse is invalid. That's a cheeky little dick, isn't it? My excuse for what exactly? Now, excuse me, Captain Judgy Pants, I'm not sure I like what you're insinuating. I don't want any part of that. That's not a game that I'm prepared to play. So what someone's done 
is they've taken an image of a person with a disability and used it to promote their agenda, trying to manipulate the able-bodied majority. Isn't that most of you? Sucked in, you've been played. Right, and I uh, appear in some photos like this, but I have untagged myself from them because I want no part of it. That's not okay. I'm not sure he would have consented to his photo being used in this way. It's called inspiration porn. And this is Amy Purdy asking, what's your excuse for objectifying me as your inspiration porn to those people who choose to create it? We don't ask for it. And in it, we're exceptionalized and objectified, right? And all this puts disabled people in a framework to suit the able-bodied majority. And sometimes their agenda is to sell you something. Microsoft did this in the last Super Bowl. They had an ad where they told the story of young Brandon. He was a child born without both of his legs and Microsoft software was amazingly involved in helping him to develop the gait patterns to help him walk using his prosthetics. Amazing that Microsoft were able to help this child live a fulfilling life. Not so amazing was that they used that act for promotional purposes playing very emotional music, showing Brandon doing very everyday things that children do and the insinuation behind that ad being that Brandon was broken and they helped fix him. Okay, so this is the problem with where the able-bodied majority and the disabled world currently intersect. That the words abled and disabled can quite literally be boiled down to two things. Able, working, complete, broken, Disabled, broken, not working, not whole. It's a lie. I never felt broken or anything less than complete. I was born with a congenital malformation, not a tattoo on my head of the word disabled that I woke up and saw in the mirror every morning. That wasn't a label that was given to me until I started going to school. And that label I had to wear like an uncomfortable and ill-fitting uniform. And it was given to me to help the able-bodied majority frame and package me, but with it, it didn't come with very many benefits. So I want you to think back to the first time that you experienced crushing rejection. The first time, because after that you develop a thicker skin to it. So let's imagine seven-year-old Deb. It's school sports day, and on this day we're gonna be playing Skittles dodgeball. There's a running race that, de that uh, determines two team captains. And so there's the two team captains and they are choosing the members from our class of 19 people, <laughs> one at a time to come and join their teams. I see the faces of delight as friends and allies are reunited. And my heart is full of hope, maybe I'll get picked next. And then there's three of us. And then my heart starts to sink and then I'm the only one standing there on the ball court. And the teacher picks a team for me to go and join, and the faces staring back at me aren't sympathetic or pleased, they're satisfied that this is how it turned out. And as I walk over to them, they groan, and this happened every week for several years. In my work, teaching, being the person with disability at the front of a room, helping people explore their movement, overcome their own internal objections. I am working to promote the attitude of inclusion that I never experienced. And that's the world that I want to see. One where we all just do this thing together and figure out ways to make it work, right? There's no reason to do it any other way because this isn't the Middle Ages. And I was born missing an arm, but I was born into a white middle class family in the developed world. I'm not one of the unlucky ones. And that disability doesn't sentence me to a life of hardship or misery. That's down to the way that other people treat me and how I choose to respond to it. So 
So I've talked to you a little bit about some instances in which the classification of disability, particularly in sport, can be a very negative thing. There are some places where it works out quite well, though. Paralympics, classification is necessary. And when I was competing as a cyclist, my classification was C5, which meant that I would compete against other people with an upper limb disability, as opposed to, say, people with a vision impairment. Makes sense. And just as it makes sense that you wouldn't race super bikes against Formula One cars, the Paralympics and the Olympics are both worthy in their standing. Because we're measuring athleticism, that's performance and output of a certain kit type, right? And they're all testing that to their limits, regardless of what that kit type might be. And that's worthy of accolade and celebration. Funnily enough, disabled enough to be classified for the Paralympics and to drive a modified vehicle and to need to apply for a special driver's license to have that modified vehicle. Not disabled enough, though, to enjoy any of the benefits that might come along with that, such as a mobility parking scheme or a freedom pass. <laughs> so the classification stuff kind of goes both ways. I'm living in murky water here. Um, but the Paralympics in recent years, especially in the UK, has been so well supported and recognized. You guys are really into it and I love that. May that long continue because that is a sign that we're moving into a world that I want to live in, one where we, be, we pass intersection into integration when people of diversity can live and work side by side in harmony. That's what it's all about. But just because someone has a disability doesn't mean they have to aspire to being a Paralympian either, which is why I'm bad out of that game. It's not the only way we can enjoy like equal attention to other people. I don't know if you've seen the movie Austin Powers or if you're a fan or not, but when they created and cast Dr. Evil and Mini-Me, that was a very brave step reminding us that uh, some people with disabilities might also be deviants. <laughs> right? We're not all sweet and innocent creatures just because we're disabled. We are three-dimensional human beings. And I'd like to see a lot more of that represented in the media. You do have a fair bit going on here in the UK, though. On telly, you've got the last leg. Cracking show. Two presenters just happen to be disabled. And the humour really works for me when they cover news and current affairs. And it's not just because Adam Hills is also Australian. It's because it's legitimately funny. And Ellie Simmons had just come back from uh, the Paralympics, back from Rio, and they were having a chat to her about how she lives with two other Paralympians and the funny stuff that happens in their household. And <laughs> they make a joke, they should call it a sitcom, two and a half women. And they start making a joke about, <laughs> about disability TV shows. Send us your hashtags. What's the next TV show featuring disability that you'd like to see on TV? And I'm like, whoa! Hold up a second, that's not what I want to see on TV. I want to see more people with disability just happening to be on TV, where it's got nothing to do with it. When can I go and see a movie that has nothing to do with disability, where the lead actor might be disabled? Oh my gosh, what if the love interest had a disability and the lead actor didn't have to think it was awkward to be attracted to someone disabled because what if his friends thought that was a creepy fetish thing? <laughs> That's a whole other TED talk right there, though. <laughs> okay. So, I want to see more of this stuff, but I am very, very fortunate to be part of the UK's growing art movement in integration. And I am part of the world's first integrated outdoor circus called Extraordinary Bodies. That needs to be playing, yeah. And Extraordinary Bodies, we have cast members that get their jobs based on talent. Who knew that was possible? We're cast on our acting ability and our performance ability. And there is another aerialist with vision impairment, hearing impairment. Um, our, one of our lead actors is a wheelchair user with cerebral palsy who gets to fly. And we have non-disabled actors and performers as well. And it's not just us. Our shows are completely inclusive and accessible to all people. We have sign language um, interpreters as part of the show and audio describers. And it's usually low cost or free outdoors. And we've just got another two years of funding from the Arts Foundation to uh, create new work, Arts Council of England, I think it was, which is really cool. So I'm very, very fortunate to be one of the people 
who lives in their passion, who gets to do their job based on merit, and not as part of filling a diversity quota, which I know happens quite a lot in the corporate world. I don't want to be the exception to the rule anymore. I want to see us living in a world that embraces diverse humanity. Because at the end of the day, we are all subject to the same human condition. We will know love, we will know loss, we will know pain, fear and joy. So one day it's going to happen, guys. You're going to leave this room and your path will intersect that of someone with a disability. How are you going to interact with them? Because <laughs> the person that I am, my capacity as a human being, what I like, what I don't like, can't be measured in fingers and toes. There are not enough hands in the world to accommodate for how much I love beer and how much I hate port. <laughs> That's all I got. Thanks very much. Thank you.